Our speaker tonight is Lisa Weiniger, and she's a specialist with NASA's Minority Institutional Research Opportunity Program, which funds and administers aerospace research and student support at minority serving institutions of higher education, including historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, and Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institutions. She is also a subject matter expert for NASA's Lingley and NASA Science Mission Directorate, most recently evaluating proposals for heliophysics miss missions, excuse me, and Venus missions. She also, another cool thing, flew missions as an airborne astronomy ambassador with the Sophia Flying Telescope in California. She is based in Kalamazoo County and divides her time between working remotely and traveling on NASA business, which she says she's going to go do tomorrow. Uh, and she and her husband raise Newfoundland dogs, including a therapy dog, Gemma, and enjoys camping and hiking. So please help me in welcoming Lisa. Okay, so glad to be with you. It's always nice to meet up with folks that have an interest in things that are related to space. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about black holes, but black holes don't just exist on their own. They are a very complicated system of stars and matter and gas and all kinds of things happening. So we're going to kind of look at the processes that make black holes happen and then what is going on with black holes. And two physicists have been really, were really engaged in thinking about black holes. Albert Einstein, under the theory, really didn't think much of black holes at all. And he said, you know, God just made a zero there. There's nothing, which interests me. Stephen Hawking, though, really took those ideas a whole lot farther. And Hawking basically thought that uh, black holes in the universe were like God throwing the dice. Sometimes you see them and sometimes you don't. So we're going to explore that a little bit tonight. And if you have questions as we go along or if I say something that you know is really, really wrong, please feel free to just kind of let me know. So we're just basically going to start out with what is a black hole? So it's an area in space that has so much gravity that nothing once sucked into the black hole can escape. And that's really rare. Um, and so obviously you wouldn't wanna be in there. Um, it is also like kind of grossly the corpse of a star. Um, we know that when anything forms, but particularly stars, it's a balancing dance between the energy source, which are small atoms that fuse together through nuclear fusion and they create big heavy atoms and they release energy. And that's the engine that drives all stars, like our sun. Um, but there's also a balancing act of gravity, holding it all together toward the center, because that's what gravity does. So stars are formed that way, and stars are also destroyed that way. The key features that we're going to talk about with these black holes is something called an accretion disk, which is the big spinny thing that we can actually observe with telescopes like the Webb or Chandra. Um, the event horizon, which is like one step past there and you're a goner. That's as far as you can go before you go into the black hole. And then the singularity. That is a great word. The singularity is the inside of the black hole, a place where the laws of physics of our universe are not thought to apply. So it's a pretty mysterious thing that's going in there. But black holes all started out as stars. That's how they had to have been a star to begin. So stars form in nebulas, and we're going to look at a couple of pictures of nebula, big clouds of gas and dust in the universe, and nuclear fusion starts and the star starts spinning, and gravity is formed and it's bringing in those uh, molecules. So gravity pulls in, nuclear fusion pushes out, there's a balance, like everything in the universe that stays basically in one spot, there's balance. And so that equilibrium continues until there aren't any more of those light atoms to fuse together and create energy. And then the star starts to die. Very gruesome. OK, so just you know, your basic physics 101. Gravity is the force that draws objects toward the center, just like our gravity is strongest the closer we go to the core of the Earth and the weakest as you go out into space. But Einstein, you know, one of my favorites, talked about gravity isn't just a force. It actually bends space and time. So the mass of an object, like a planet, causes the space around it to bend and curve, and that affects the rate at which time passes. And this is really important for black holes because they have such immense gravity that they have an, like an incredible effect on everything that comes into their path. Nuclear fusion I talked about a little bit, and then at the end when there aren't any atoms left to fuse, there's a lot of big heavy atoms there, and gravity takes control. 
So just basically life cycle of stars, I'm not gonna belabor this too much, but there's a lot of different paths that stars can take after they form. And in one whole set of um, like following along in the life cycle of the star, you basically have a red giant and you get a white dwarf and you get a black dwarf and you just end up with little tiny things. But if you go in the other direction, we could have a red supergiant and that supergiant would, would supernova. So the gi most gigantic um, explosion you could ever imagine. And then there's two things that can happen after a supernova. You can get a neutron star or you can get a black hole. So what we're really looking at is that path that says death and remnants in the very back in that black hole as a dead star, but not dead in the sense that we think of dead, that nothing happens and nothing moves and there's nothing going on. This is like a zombie star because it's sucking everything in. So I'm, I'm aiming it at the younger people in the back. No, just kidding. So, you know, it doesn't just sit there passively. It's playing a huge role. So this is a horsehead nebula. Um, and this is one of the new first images from the James Webb telescope. Nebula are star nurseries. So there's lots of stuff in there. And if enough of that stuff can aggregate or you can develop gravity and fusion occurs, then stars are born. And you can see little teeny tiny baby stars in there. Um, and a lot of them form in systems that have two or more stars, not like us, we just have one. Um, hang on a minute, I just, you know, the thing that always escapes me are the numbers. So the Horsehead Nebula is about, well, almost about 1400 light years away from us. The next image from the new first images is the Carina Nebula, and it looks different, but the same kinds of things are going on. Um, these are colorized so that we can understand the different temperatures and stuff. The Carina Nebula is, it's about 7,500 light years away from us. So imagine being able to see the, this clarity, something that's 7,500 light years, it's not 7,500 miles, it's at the speed of light. So the fact that we're receiving this information, we're seeing what it was like how long ago? 7,500 years, there you go. Um, so Sagittarius A is one of the um, black holes that we've been able to actually capture some images of. And, and you know, it's the yellow in the middle with the, like, it looks like a fried up donut <laughs> in the corner. Um, and if we look at it, I'm gonna show you a quick video or a piece of a video. This is an observation from a ground-based observatory. Uh, let's see here. I'm just gonna look at this for a second. If only we could travel this fast in space, wouldn't that be amazing? So the music is the parents. is what's wrapped around the black hole. You're not seeing a black hole at all. Let's see if we can advance this out of here. Okay, so Sagittarius A is a supermassive black hole. And it's one of those things where you can tell it's there by what it does to the stuff around it. It's kind of like cosmic bumper cars. Only this bumper car is big and round and it's constantly knocking everything else out of its way unless it runs into another bumper car and kind of absorbs it and comes together. So this is a 20 year time lapse, which is not very long in cosmic terms, obviously, but I just want you to look, I don't know if you can see here. If you look at this, you can see where the black hole is. Look at all the stuff that's rotating around this region of space because different things are getting there and they're bouncing off. And some of them are getting absorbed actually into the black hole. Okay, so black holes 101, basically three kinds. It's kind of like, um, you know, Goldilocks and the three bears. There's the big and the little <laughs> and the medium size. So there's a lot of very small black holes and they say small but deadly. So if a star collapses, it will compress, it can create the black hole. And if you have a high mass, you get a certain size of black hole. If you have a smaller mass, 
you get a smaller black hole. But remember, they're like Pac-Man eating their way through the region that they're in. If they come across anything that doesn't have enough uh, resistance to move away from it, they just gobble it all the way up. This is on a small scale. But these smaller black holes, there's anywhere from 10 million to a billion of them. So they've been around for a long time. And some move and some don't move. But we're, you know, we're very concerned, oh, there's a black hole. You know, we need to understand it's a relatively routine kind of thing to see after the death of the star. OK, supermassive black holes. How can you lose with a name like supermassive? So they, are, they can be billions of times larger than, say, our sun. Um, we're not exactly sure how these very, very large black holes are created. I mean, they gather a lot of material in there. But are they the process of a bunch of little black holes that have all managed to merge together? Um, were they the process of a really, really, really large gas cloud that had lots and lots of material? So when it all came together and it created, it went into the hole, the hole was really big. Um, or could they be the result of an entire cluster of stars that all died, ran out of fuel and died? If they were created at the same time, then theoretically they could have kind of died at about the same time. But what I love about black holes is we don't know the answers yet. That's why we're looking. There's no way we're going to know these things unless we go out and look and measure them. Now, one theory is that these could be the result of the conglomeration of large amounts of dark matter. So we know that the universe is composed of small amounts of actual matter, the kind that we can see that you and I are made of and stars in the planet. But apparently there's a flip side to that dark to it that's a dark matter that we don't see, but it occupies all this space in the universe. So what if a black hole was able to be formed from clusters of dark matter? We don't, we don't know. We don't know what dark matter is even made of, but we are relatively certain that something like that exists and takes up space. So supermassive black holes, while a very scary name, we don't have a great big handle on what makes them work. And that's another reason why we're really trying to up our game in terms of looking farther out into the universe and understanding how these things work. We'll be able to look at black holes in all stages of their developments with increased you know, capability of observation. So we'll be able to look at little ones and big ones and old ones and young ones. And if we can kind of track that, we'll be able to have an understanding of how they do form and what impact they have as they are wherever they're located in the universe. So then they're stuck in the middle, right? It's kind of like the old song. Um, so we have intermediate black holes, but, and it used to be, we thought they were only tiny or gigantic. Well, there are some in the middle and they could form when we have stars collide in a chain reaction. They could fall together in the center of a galaxy and then they could create a supermassive black hole. Um, I like the notion that we have them in the heart of dwarf galaxies. And so if we're looking at X-ray activity in those areas, then we could say, wow, there might be as many as 300,000 of these in the areas that we can observe. Um, and so we're working on it. We're still looking to try to find as many of these as we can and categorize what they're like and where they originated. And that should tell us something. Okay, so this goes back to the idea that the black hole really is the tail end of like one strand of what can happen to a star. Um, black because it doesn't emit or reflect light. Remember, for us to see anything in space, there has to be energy. You know, it might not be light in the spectrum that we can see with our eyes, it might be x-rays. And I don't know about any of you, I can't see x-rays, but um, you know, it could be infrared, which some animals can sense. But this, when you actually get to the black hole itself, nothing. There's no light coming and no light going. And so that makes it really hard to look at. Um, but if we look at, at this process, we know that they're constantly being formed, which raises the question of, does a black hole have a lifespan? We know they're created, but do they die? Could they die? Is it the, the gravity so massive that all they do is go around and gobble everything up like Pac-Man and get bigger and bigger? And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Okay, so we looked at that description and we were looking at um, kind of the giant, the red giants. And we were saying that what they'll do is just have a gigantic explosion called a supernova. So it is a huge explosion of a star. And we really wanna to try to see those because it's really interesting um, when it occurs, but it's like the last stage of a massive star or when a white dwarf ends up getting triggered to burn up all its fuel really, really, really quickly. So it's a matter of a very short time frame. It runs out of fuel, boom, it blows up. 
So what does that have to do with our black hole? Well, first of all, you, we all know we're all made of matter. Everything in the universe is made of matter. Matter is constantly being recycled. There's no new matter. There's no old matter. Okay, what we have is what we have. If we didn't have supernova to disperse these atoms of the different elements out into the universe, we wouldn't have other stars and we wouldn't have planets because everything is constantly being recycled, you know, planets as well. So what we want to do is we want to have these supernova occur so that it doesn't all just stay in the cycle of stars. Some of it goes out back into the nebula and we might see other planetary formation or other star formation. So supernova are really important. Without it, no planets. Okay, so let's look at this kind of diagram of the black hole. And there's, by the way, if anybody here is artistic, there's a huge market for people who do like space art. These people work for NASA and they create the most wonderful images. So what we're gonna learn about is that swirly pattern around the outside, which is called the accretion disk, the relativistic jet, which is gases that come, uh, like get pushed away, the event horizon, which is the very last step before you fall into the black hole and the black hole itself is the singularity. And um, that is not a place where you would want to go to because you certainly would never come back. Imagine the gravity, as much gravity as could ever be generated and your human body was in the path of that, not gonna happen. And I've often had people say, but you know, like what about wormholes? These aren't wormholes. These are giant sucking gravity killers that you just won't want to not bring your spacecraft anywhere near. Okay, so the outside that we actually can see, that is called the accretion disk. And accrete, you know, things gather and kind of get stuck on there. Um, most black holes do form in a binary system. So you have two stars um, and then the star can get, the other star can get sucked apart by the black hole. So it's like very cannibalistic. So the matter that is circling the black hole, it's circling the drain, so to speak, is what we see as the accretion disk. And it circles and circles until, you know, it gradually starts getting pulled into the black hole itself because gravity there is incredibly strong. So if we look at these disks, um, they're very powerful. They're very violent. There's lots of waves and things going on throughout them. The temperature is incredibly high. And so we're observing those like in the X-ray part, X-ray wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum to try to understand their heat. And when we look at that also, we can measure the black hole by being able to measure the size of the accretion disk. And it's important because then we know, do we have a big one on our hands or do we have a small one? And they'll have very different impacts on what's going on around them. Okay, so let's talk about the event horizon. I feel like there's a movie that was called Event Horizon. Does this ring a bell? Okay, I could be wrong there. I see a lot of movies. Okay, so the area around the theoretical boundary of the black hole surrounding the singularity and now you're more than welcome to take the word singularity and use it as an insult to everyone you know, because it's a place where like the laws of the universe don't exist. So the event horizon is really interesting because what happens inside that is invisible to everyone or everything outside of the event horizon. The singularity is a place where no laws of physics actually occur. And if you get close, if you get past the event horizon, you're done. You're down the black hole and there's no coming back. And you know, consider what would happen to any object if you put it in a black hole. Well, it'd be in, you know, <laughs> there's like the, the immense pressure of you know, uh, tons and tons and tons of gravitational force. So the, you know, you'd be pretty much just smushed quick, fast, and in a hurry. Um, so the event horizon is the thing that hides the singularity. So it's kind of like the boundary. And then after that, you've gone over the waterfall um, and it refers to it as the point of no return. So near the singularity, gravity is so strong that nothing can escape, not even light, not in any wavelength on the electromagnetic spectrum. And what happens to the matter that gets pulled into this black hole is that there are tides. So there's like waves of gravity and they're swirling around and everything is just completely crushed until it becomes incredibly dense. And that continues then to um, build the gravity in the black hole because the denser something is, then the more that the gravity can act on it. So this is like uh, astrophysics 101. Do black holes move? 
I think like everybody has a hidden terror that like a black hole is going to come sweeping through our galaxy and our solar system. We're all going to be pulled into it. Um, scientists were of the belief that black holes could move, but they thought it was very rare because to be honest, we didn't have the ability to observe them moving. So we knew they existed, but we didn't have the capability of seeing where it was that they're going. But right now we have a supermassive black hole and it's just speeding across its galaxy, just going on its merry way. And the question is, why is that? Is it like a, uh, you know, like a billiard table where you have the, the, the ball and it's bouncing off all the other balls and they kind of move out of the way and you continue on your way? Or is there some other kind of force that's driving this thing to move so quickly? Um, that black hole is about 3 million times bigger than the sun. It's moving at 110,000 miles per hour. So that's fast. It's about 230 million light years from us. So it's not like, you know, we need to worry about it next week. But, you know, the things that we observe in space, you know, a lot of them are kind of coming toward our sphere too. So it's a good idea to know how the mechanics of space around us work. Okay. So this is kind of the story of the two physicists, Einstein and Hawking. And Albert, you know, he was a wonderful scientist and he had the general theory of relativity. And he was of the opinion that if anything went down the black hole, it was gone forever. And, you know, everything is information. So atoms and energy and waves and all that stuff, it's information. And so he just said, once it's gone, it's gone. Which, you know, a lot of people had a hard time with that, understanding that it doesn't work that way with matter, like you can never actually destroy an atom. So, you know, from the perspective of, of Einstein in general relativity, it was pretty simplistic. You know, the matter becomes too great, gravity interacts, it goes toward the middle, and that nothing ever comes out of it. And that was the school of thought for quite a long time, until we had the capability of understanding more. You know, I was a former science teacher, and that's what I always say about science is, you know, you can expect it to change. Nothing stays the same in science. We always learn more, know more, figure out more. It's not like we were wrong before when we thought that the earth was in the middle of our solar system. That's just all they knew back then. So, but when we have better capability to learn more, then we can have more accurate observations and theories about why things work the way they do. So, I had said Einstein basically thought that, you know, black holes just sat there and there weren't that many of them. And once you, you, something was in it, it never came back out. But Stephen Hawking came back and really did some math. He mathed the heck out of this thing. And he said that if you look at quantum mechanics, which is where we're looking at things at the sub, 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 sub atomic level, matter behaves differently than it does you know, at the higher level. And so he did a lot of um, analysis of this problem in a mathematical sense. And he said that black holes slowly let things out. They slowly let radiation out. And we're gonna show you what it's actually called. So he's saying, well, if anything's ever coming out of that black hole, then it must lose mass. And if it loses mass, then its gravity is gonna be reduced because there's less stuff to act on it. And eventually the black hole will just evaporate. Okay, so that's a novel idea. And it'd be really nice to be able to prove through actual observations whether that happens. You know, Einstein, I said this before, Einstein never did a physical experiment in his life. He did thought experiments. Everything he thought of, he said, okay, this is the thing. But in his time, we didn't have the science to prove it. But 100 years, 150 years later, they do have the science to actually experiment with his theories and find out that they were relatively accurate. So when we have a next leap forward, when we're looking at like quantum, what's going on at the sub, sub, sub atomic level. So how are we gonna test that? So with the Hawking theory, they've actually been trying to measure, I mean, how do you know if a black hole is getting smaller? You measure its radius. It's like, what's the joke about this, right? There's a joke about how do you know about a lot, a lot of, um, must be a little kid joke if I know it. Okay, so Hawking said that black holes have a temperature. And so if they have temperature over time, they're going to lose their temperature. They're gonna release all their mass and energy back into the universe. So the information that was trapped in that black hole is then gonna come back out and be accessible for other kinds of mechanics that are going on in the universe. Um, and this is called Hawking radiation. Oh, wouldn't you love to be a scientist and come up with a big old theory and have your name on it forever? 
Yeah, I think I might be a little old for that, but still, you know, the Lisa Weiniger paradox of whatever, whatever. Okay. Anyway, sorry, that's just me digressing. So he's saying, okay, it's slowly leaking, but at the very end, there's just two particles left in this little black hole. And then pew, when the black hole is gone, the information is released back into the universe in tiny, tiny subatomic pieces, and nothing is lost and no information is changed. And so it can go back into the universe, which is kind of a very interesting and also encouraging way to think about this. Okay, so I'm gonna talk just for a second about time because this is just mind blowing. Okay, so we know time doesn't work the same everywhere. That seems weird, but you know what? I've had my teeth drilled on in the dentist and it seemed like it took three days and it was like 30 minutes. So time is very relative, but um, as gravity increases, time slows down. That even works on our planet, although you can't really observe it because it's too little, but like your feet, they, or your head, it act, actually ages faster than your feet because it's, your head is subjected to less gravitational force. I know that seems kind of weird. If you live on top of a mountain, time will seem like it goes faster and time at the bottom will seem like it goes slower. Just really hard to measure the increment of that. So if you had, this is a book I have to show you. If you were to fall into a black hole, and your friend watched you fall into the black hole, don't do this at home, by the way, your clock would run slower and slower and slower than theirs. And this is called time dilation. So you, it would seem like an infinite amount of time for you to cross this area, whereas to the person, to you, it would seem like very little time had passed at all. So space time, travel, that kind of thing. Can we boomerang off a black hole? I don't know. So I have a book over here. It's kind of a kid's book, like a middle school book called um, Icarus at the Edge of Time. Brian Green, who's a really well-known physicist, wrote it. And it takes the story of Icarus and reimagines it as a young man who is in space with his family or doing whatever. And he hops into a spaceship because he wants to go look at a black hole. And everybody's like, don't do this. <laughs> but you know, the story. And, at, and so he goes and checks out the event horizon and then manages to make his way back. And when he comes back, it's 140,000 years later. So dad wasn't kidding when he said, don't go play at the black hole because you know, by the time he came back, it was a completely different universe. So it's a good story, kind of cautionary. So if you fell into a black hole, what would happen is you would just be scrunched, you'd be stretched, you'd be scrunched. The tidal forces would kind of push and pull you and you would turn into a big piece of spaghetti and eventually you'd be crushed into a tiny little bit. So not a good thing to do. And this is, illustrates what it would be like if we tried to take a spacecraft into it. Cause you know, in sci-fi, you always see stuff like that. We have our spaceship and you'll notice that the closer it gets to the black hole, the more elongated it is and the longer it is closest to the black hole. So at this point in time, it's a long strand. And then once it actually hits the event horizon, it's gone. And if that was you, this would be an incredibly painful experience and I do not encourage it whatsoever. <laughs> okay, so how do we know a black hole is there? It's because the things around it behave oddly. The black hole does what it does, but other things get sucked into it or get pushed away from it. And you can see from this image, kind of see that circle that's going. When all those things are moving around and trying to stay away or balanced away, that would be where we would look at it. Because with the black hole's gravity, you have to have an, uh, an equal amount of gravity to be balanced a certain distance away. And if you get any closer, you'll be sucked into the black hole. Uh, we also can see material falling into the black hole. So if you look right there in the middle, that's Sagittarius A, and slowly those pieces are being pulled in. And then we have jets of glowing gas. And this is coming away from the black hole. So it's matter that's escaping before it gets sucked into the black hole and generally speaking, lighter matter. Okay, I'm a big believer in telescopes. So the Chandra X-ray Observatory um, was launched um, in 1999. It's looking at X-ray. X-ray is really good for black holes because we can see things that have a lot of heat and a lot of motion. And obviously we've got the web now, which is a little bit different thing, but Chandra was really engaged in looking for black holes, supernovas, and dark matter. Um, and let's see if this comes up. I'm just going to show you a little clip of what Chandra saw. Hurling hot material into space at close to the speed of light, Do not stand in front of that.
through the Chandra Observatory data and you were to see that, this would be, you know, number one, we've got a black hole here. Number two, it's pretty active because different times it's emitting these bursts. So it's sucking up other material. It could be taking in other stars. It could be running up on other black holes and just kind of merging with them. Okay, now this is cool. And somebody had said, you know, when things move and matter moves and they hit off each other, it creates sound waves. So this is what one black hole in the Perseus galaxy sounds like. That sounds like if you were to hear that and you didn't know that it was sound coming out of a black hole what would you think it was a monster or something my husband said it's people revving their cars at really low i'm like okay <laughs> what's a guy thing right but i think when we look at like you know people are always saying that they're getting sounds coming from space and there must be signs that there's other life forms and all this stuff not at all the mechanics of of matter they make noise and these black holes are gigantic and they're a long way away. So you get kind of this low groaning sound, which is really quite ominous, I think. Okay, so another friend of mine, I worked on this project a little bit, is called TESS. And TESS is a satellite that is mainly built to look for exoplanets. So it's looking in the infrared, um, but TESS is focused to look outside of our solar system and while Tess is looking for exoplanets, she came across a black hole. Because when you look, guess what? You're not always gonna see exactly the thing that you thought you were. On January 21st, 2019, for the very first time, NASA's Tess saw a black hole destroy a star. This was a tidal disruption event, which occurs when a star passes too close to a black hole. Extreme gravity causes the star to bulge and break apart into a stream of gas. The tail of the stream escapes into space, but the rest swings around to form an accretion disk. This event, called Assassin 19BT for the All Sky Automated Survey for Supernovae, which first identified it, happened in the TESS Continuous Viewing Zone. TESS's four cameras scan large sectors of the sky, and one constantly monitored this region for a full year. TESS saw Assassin 19BT as soon as it started to brighten, days before other observatories spotted it. NASA's SWIFT satellite quickly observed the outburst in visible light, UV, and, along with the European XMM-Newton satellite, okay, X-rays. You're going to think all these, um, all these telescopes and all these observatories are all looking at the same stuff. Well, they're all looking out into space, and this was a huge event, but I have to say, you just got to love it when the, it's called assassin. <laughs> okay, you know, it's just like, wow. You know, I work for NASA and, and probably the thing we're best at, even better than going to space is making up acronyms. So assassin is an acronym for something, but it's basically meant to imply that this is a killer too. So Tess was out there looking at exoplanets in the course of looking, or looking for black holes in the course of looking for exoplanets, planets that are outside of our solar system. And this is a picture of Tess. Okay, so Stephen Hawking, here he is, that black holes leak their particles. That's called Hawking radiation because what happens inside the event horizon, or actually at the event horizon, is quantum mechanics, not general mechanics. Every particle carries away a little bit of the mass of the black hole. It shrinks, but the smaller ones obviously shrink more quickly. And so Hawking radiation is the same as what we call black body radiation. So it's coming off of a black object and it's emitting heat and light. Okay, now we have a cannibal black hole, even better. You sense a theme here? <laughs> so, you know, we don't, we don't call them like daffodil black holes. You know, they have things like assassin and cannibal and all that stuff. Um, so it's a supermassive black hole. It's about 13 billion light years away. It is 160,000 light years long. So this is gigantic. And this was picked up by the Chandra Observatory. So lots and lots of different things are pointed at the sky. And if you luck out, you make a discovery like this. And if you don't, well, then you don't. So this is our supermassive black hole. It's got jets coming out in both directions. And the accretion disk is gigantic. 
So where that'll end up, I guess we'll just keep watching. But remember, even with Hawking's theory, it's gonna take a long time for this one to break apart. The brightest black hole. So that would mean that it's got a big accretion disk and lots of gases coming away from it. Um, and then I have one more. I just want you to see, do you think this sounds like the other one? It reminds me in Star Wars, the sound they make when they have spaceships flying through the universe, you know, although it does sound a little bit like a Greek chorus as well. You know? I do know if I was in space and that sound was to come to me, I'd be a little freaked out. Now here's something cool. They're, they've theorized for a long time, scientists, that gravity doesn't just travel in a straight path from here to there, that there actually are ebbs and flows, highs and lows, and those are gravitational waves. And sure enough, we figured out that two black holes, when they collided, then that sent a gravitational wave throughout the universe. And gravitational waves have hit the Earth before. That's not uncommon. We just don't perceive them because it's really, really a small amount of energy. But the idea that gravity behaves maybe more in like a wave type fashion as opposed to a straight line fashion, it's good to be able to see what causes that. What if there was one that was near us? How would it affect us? This is the sound of two black holes colliding and merging. Where did this sound come from? A long time ago, in the distant reaches of the universe, two black holes, each about 30 times as massive as our sun, were locked in orbit and spiraling in towards each other. The only visible traces of this spinning cataclysm would have been the way their gravitational fields warped the light of distant stars. Even as they collided and merged, there wasn't a flicker of light to be seen. The real and very violent action in the system was in the form of gravitational waves, ripples in the very fabric of space and time. These waves were constantly draining energy from the black hole orbits, leading to their ultimate collision and merger to form a single now, I just black want hole. you to think back on what At I talked instant, about before. If gravity is one of the key impacts on how time passes in the space-time you know, sector, strong enough gravitational waves then could be considered ripples in time. So we wouldn't see things going in a straight line chronologically. They would be variable depending on whether or not they were impacted by a gravitational wave. It would have to be pretty strong, like close to where the collision occurred. But you could have, I wouldn't call it a wormhole, but I would call it something that affects how you could get faster from point A to point B. So if wormholes existed, I always get this question, what would happen if a black hole fell into a wormhole? First of all, we don't know that wormholes exist. It's just a theoretical construct, but I don't think that you would find a black hole falling into anything. They're enormous and they're incredibly dense. I guess in like the final analysis, if a black hole were to go through to the other side of a wormhole, whatever was on the other side of the wormhole would be very unhappy. <laughs> so, what are we trying to learn by doing this? You know, a lot of people are like, you know, why do we spend so much time and effort on finding out what's going on so far away? What difference does that make to us? Well, with black holes, we're trying to understand matter at its most fundamental level. What is matter? How does matter work? Can it work differently than how we see it work every day in our life on this planet? How do these big jets form? How does the energy come out of a black hole? And then in some sense, when we're looking back, we're trying to figure out how the universe formed. We're trying to figure out how the universe continues to grow and at what rate. And we're looking at ideas like, will our universe ever end? Are there multiple other universes? Is that a possibility? You know, all these things are on the table, but, and it seems like you could never figure them out. But we've come so far in such a short amount of time. And we have such sophisticated instruments that I think these kinds of questions are the things we're starting to kind of get our minds around a little bit. Um, now, we've got the James Webb, and I think some of you were here for the first images program, which is absolutely astounding. I just wanted to point out one of the first images was a quintet. It was so, it was five galaxies. It's called Stephen's Quintet. And it's not that far away, relatively speaking, in space. So it's going to give us the chance to see what happens when you have five galaxies all mixing and blending all by each other. Um, and so the images, show how these interacting galaxies trigger the formation of stars and the destruction of stars and what's happening with the gas and the dust. And it also shows outflows from a black hole. So part of the question is how much of the mechanics of this 
five pack of galaxies is being driven by the black hole that's really prominent in there. Um, and we think that these kinds of like really tight groups of galaxies were a lot more common when the universe was forming. So it might give us more insight into the formation of the universe. So here's our quintet. And this portion up here that's super bright is where the black hole is. And you can see it looks markedly different than the other galaxies that are there. It's about 290 mi uh, million light years from Earth, which is, you know, in terms of the universe, not all that far. This, these galaxies were originally discovered with a telescope in the 1800s. Um, and then, you know, we've been able to observe it over time for quite a while. This black hole is sucking in material from all around this region. So what impact is it gonna have on those other galaxies and the planets that are in those galaxies? So that will be an interesting thing to be able to continue to observe. And with the web, we're gonna have the firepower to be able to do that. Okay, I'm coming to the end of this because I just wanted to see if we had any questions. I don't know how many of you are astronomers. That I am not an astronomer by trade at all, but there are some amazing programs that you can be a citizen scientist and you can go to them and you can find things like exoplanets and black holes. And they, we have actually had instances where somebody was looking at these, you know, these images and usually they send them to your uh, computer. And they were looking at the way something really weird was crossing across the face of a star and they found like a whole separate set of planets. And so, I mean, I guess we'd name it like planet Lisa and planet Ellen or whatever. If we were the ones who found it, that would be so cool. So these are the ones I would recommend if you're ever interested in just kind of delving into looking at real world star charts and pictures and all this kind of stuff, backyard world, planet nine, we're looking for planet nine. TESS is the citizen science component of the one that I showed you. And you can actually planet if you're lucky enough to do that. Globe at night is good. Galaxy Zoo is a lot of fun. Um, and then the other ones as well. So, and this will be on my slideshow and my slideshow is available through Ellen and her crew. So, um, you know, you just Google it and it'll tell you, they, they'll give you as many as you want to try to explore and see if you can see something that nobody else has seen yet, or you can verify something that somebody else has speculated about. And you know, we're looking out into the vastness of space and it's sometimes really hard to discern what's really happening. But if more than one person sees it or they observe something that's a real anomaly, then that's your opportunity to make your mark. Okay, I work for NASA and you've seen this before, but I'm doing it anyway because this is our trademark. Remember, we are going back to the moon and from moon, we're gonna to go to Mars. And it's the first Artemis launch, which is the uncrewed first launch for the Artemis mission, which will go to the moon, Artemis, my earrings, the sister of Apollo, goddess of the moon. Um, and so this is kind of just giving you the heads up on your space agency. Ignition sequence start. All engines are running. We have taken tremendous steps. We choose to go to the moon before this dictate is out. We have achieved the earth shaking, the breathtaking. The groundbreaking have left a mark in the heavens. Our successes build one upon another and amplify what is possible. It's time we take the next great leap. We're building the next chapter of American exploration, returning to the moon to stay, so we can go beyond to Mars to expand what's possible and further our understanding. The architecture for these missions is already taking shape. We will go with new systems, bold designs, and a sustainable mission. You can hear it, taste it, touch it. We are going. We are training, testing, pressing our pioneering spirit into every component, defining our resolve with every line of code, and securing our success with every welcomed partnership. This is not hypothetical. This is not about flags and footprints. This is about sustainable science and feeding forward the advance of the human spirit. Because we are the pioneers, the star sailors, the thinkers, the visionaries, the doers. And
because we stand on the shoulders of giants to go farther than humanity has ever been. We will add our names to the roles of the greatest adventurers in history. Every day, every mission, we advance this call. We are NASA. And after 60 years, we're just getting started. So that concludes my presentation about black holes. Um, I just did want to let you know that the Artemis One mission will be launching right at the end of August from Kennedy Space Center. If you happen to be on the East Coast, you can pretty much see it all the way up the coast to about New York. But if not, you can watch it online. NASA live streams all their launches. It is going to be a doozy. So if you get the opportunity to go on there, you know, NASA is your agency. NASA is one of the biggest science agencies in the world. And everything we do is for the public good and nothing is for profit. So we really try to encourage people to engage with the missions and engage in what we do and come to work for us too. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming out.